What a splendid sight you are. You can't see it from here, but I can. I can't see all that well, but it is, it's, it's a magnificent sight and a, a great sign of hope. And hope is the one thing ultimately that the human being can't live without, certainly the church can't. If we're supposed to be that great beacon of hope, then uh, we need signs of hope. And this gathering is certainly one of those. Um, in a time when we are under pressure, there's no question about that. But in the midst of all those pressures and the perplexities that they bring, just have a look at this. And the fact of the matter is we could have doubled this number. So again, something is happening. We're not going out of business. Business is changing. But we're not going out of business. And if you want a sign of that, then just look around you now. Or come and stand up here and look out there. <laughs> I am intensely conscious as I stand among you uh, that I face the danger of being pale, male and stale. <laughs> It is a risk, I admit, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that the church in this city, certainly, but around the country and around the world, is becoming increasingly less pale, less male, and we hope less stale. <laughs> certainly, the proclaimed conference takes as its prime target the kind of staleness that really can't see the future. Because here at Proclaim, what we set ourselves to do is to press the refresh button in the church, right across the nation. So as you come to do that, I say welcome in the name of the Archdiocese of Brisbane. I said earlier there's a DNA in this city, a friendliness in the DNA of this city. It's absolutely true. It's the sort of thing I've encountered before in big country towns and sometimes people, usually from down south as we say here, <laughs> regard Brisbane as a big country town. Well, if you do, think again. Uh, this is a seriously large and sophisticated city. It's not Sydney or Melbourne, but it doesn't have to be. But one of the most unusual things about this big and sophisticated city is that it does have a friendliness in the DNA. And this spills over inevitably into the life of the Archdiocese. So I say welcome to the River City. And I say welcome to the Archdiocese of Brisbane. When Archbishop Polding bade farewell to Brisbane, when it was cut off from Sydney and made into a diocese in its own right, he said that Brisbane may well be our poorest diocese, but it may well also be spiritually our richest. Well, we're not the poorest. We're certainly not the richest, though spiritually we have great gifts. And these gifts we offer to you with a full and open heart as you come among us for this proclaimed conference. But then you bring your gifts from wherever you come. So I welcome you with your gifts and thank you for the gift that you are and the gifts that you bring. In a particular way, I echo the thanks already made to people like John Dew and Kike and others who have come a long, long way to share your gift with us. This is a beautiful thing that happens in that community of disciples that make their home in Jesus. So to all of you, whoever you are, wherever you've come from, welcome to Brisbane and welcome to the Archdiocese and thank you for your gift. Words have always fascinated me, even when I was a kid. It's hard to say why this sort of thing happens, but in my own life it's undeniable. People often accuse me, I suppose, of being a wordsmith, but my wordsmithery is born from that lifelong fascination with words. And I happen to think that language is the, the best thing human beings have ever done. And for the scripture, it's one of those points where we share most deeply in the creativity of God. Animals can make a lot of noise but they can't speak. They can't do what I'm doing now in your presence. So words are fascinating and important and powerful. 
And on the wall behind me, in front of you, there is that big word that gives us the title of the conference, proclaim. Now, proclaim in English comes from the Latin word, proclamare, to cry forth. Proclamare. So given that it comes from the Latin proclamare, really the form of the word in English should be not proclaim, but proclam, C-L-A-M. But you can see immediately there's a problem with that. Uh, the problem, of course, is the sense of clamming up, which is exactly what proclaim is not saying. What proclaim is saying is that we claim to have something important to say. And we're going to speak it forth, cry it out. We make a claim. We don't clam up. So we've got something to communicate and something we believe really matters, not just for us, but for everybody. Now, when Christians speak of proclaiming, we're talking about what we call the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't an ethical or moral code. It's not a political program. It's not an ideological package. It's not a smart philosophy. It's none of those though it might include include elements of those. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, which is an experience. Here I cite the words of John Paul II, or at least echo them in the very first letter that he wrote to the whole church after he was elected as Pope all those years ago. He said, Christianity is not a religion, really. It's an experience. Of amazement is the word that he used. I would say when we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, we are talking about an experience of liberation. Now, if you want to know what that liberation actually looks like, what that experience is, just consider that extraordinary story that has so moved us all in recent days of those boys in Thailand in the caves. It's a brilliant metaphor of what the scripture and what we Christians mean when we talk about salvation. Sometimes when we talk that language, salvation and redemption, people haven't got a clue what we're talking about. But focus on this story. Here you've got these boys trapped and they can do absolutely nothing to rescue themselves. It's like those Chilean miners a few years ago, remember them? They were exactly the same kind of story. They're trapped underground. They can do nothing to set themselves free. But others come to their rescue and this is the good news. And it is in a world that drowns in bad news, we're intensely moved and then finally overjoyed when they're rescued because there's the truth of the human situation caught up in this somehow. Those boys, those miners are you and me. Others come to their rescue and finally they are set free. And in that story we recognise a, a kind of good news that goes to the heart of the truth of where we are as human beings. So that's what we're talking about. We, the human race, in fact are trapped we mightn't even recognise it. But this is the truth, at least as the scripture has it. And we can do absolutely nothing down there in the darkness but wait and hope that someone comes. Even someone like that Thai diver who actually died. Died of a lack of oxygen when he was delivering oxygen to the boys in their cave. Redemption, the death that leads to life. So that's what we're talking about. 
God comes to our rescue in Jesus who dies so that we might live. Now this is an experience. There was nothing theoretical of what happened in the lives of those boys, the wild boars. It was an experience and an experience that will change them forever as it did the lives of those Chilean miners who were set free. So this is the good news that we have to proclaim. Now, before we speak, before we tell the great story and announce the vision of hope that the story brings to birth, according to the scripture, we have to listen. Now, Shane has touched upon this. It all begins with listening. The scripture begins with the words found in the book of Deuteronomy. Shema Yisrael. Listen Israel. The words that the Jewish people repeat every day to remind themselves of where the journey begins. Listening to a word that is not our own, a voice that is not ours, the word of God. St Benedict, whom we celebrated yesterday, talk about a refresh button in the life of the church. Just look at him in his cave. And out of the cave he writes the rule that will give birth to modern Europe, really, and bring to birth a whole civilization, a new way of being human. And what's the first word he writes as he begins to compose his rule? Ausculta. Listen. Again, he echoes the scripture. So there is a word to be heard. There's a voice in the darkness. If you sit long enough and with an open ear and listen. It's the word that God spoke in the beginning. You know the start of the biblical story? In the beginning there was the the darkness, the emptiness, the chaos. And then you hear the breathing. (sighs) The, The breath of God moving through the darkness. And then we're told God said light and there was light. But God said light. What happens? The divine breath hits the divine vocal cords and out comes the one word. But it's a word that is power. And that's what we're talking. Not some empty label, but a word that brings to birth worlds, that brings light out of darkness, fullness out of emptiness, order out of chaos and boys from drowning caves. That's the power we're talking. So the word that we hear is a word of power that opens us to that experience of liberation which is the good news. So power to rescue is what we're talking about when we speak of the word of God. So when we talk proclamation, as we do here in these days, we're talking about hearing. We don't do that, nothing else happens. Hearing and then speaking and then acting because the word of God is not just spoken The word of God is something that is done. So to proclaim is to hear, to speak, but also to act. Now, the young, I think, are the canary in the mine. Another way of saying the same thing is that the young are the megaphone of common experience, the experience of us all. So perhaps in a moment like this, as we set forth together into the future, we'd better listen to the young in a particular way in this year of youth, and that's what we're seeking to do here at Proclaim, to listen to what they're saying because they are the canary in the mine. I think of the young people who come to World Youth Day, for instance. 
in their droves, thousands upon thousands of them. And they have what is a very powerful experience for all kinds of reasons, the experience of being together, the experience of pilgrimage and so on it goes. It's a powerful experience that can shape their life in deep and lasting ways. But then they return home and that's when the problem starts because they go to their parish, for instance, and the experience is so utterly different that the energy just dwindles and finally fades away. It's the follow-up that has always been the challenge. They find it different than the high point that they have known. They find it disappointing. This is true even of young people who might in some sense be considered conservative. And it is an intriguing fact that we, my generation certainly, needs to ponder that why is it that young people, excellent young people who are clearly on a spiritual search, why are they often drawn to communities and to groups that my generation would consider conservative? They're not going back to anything they once knew. They're finding a home in something that might look odd to you or to me, but which is not disappointing to them. Now again, it's a phenomenon that we need to interpret rightly if we want to understand what's going on around us. So in looking beyond our parishes, Are these young people, whoever they are, and whatever their ideological stamp, are they saying that in fact we need a new paradigm? Now this is easy to stand and say. It's harder to do. Do we need a new paradigm of our local communities of faith? One thing Pope Francis said in Evangelii Gaudium is that the parish is never outmoded. Why? Because the parish, in a sense, can become anything. It's been just about everything in history. So it's not as if the parish is something that and can't become anything else. It can become anything. So how can we imagine the parish as something new, something we haven't seen before, something that doesn't leave everything behind, but isn't afraid to do it differently. And what might doing it differently mean? Are young people saying to us, all of us, that we need a new kind of language? Because so often what the church says is completely incomprehensible. Even to people of good faith, people who want to understand and accept what we have to say, particularly in areas to do with marriage and the family, human sexuality, and I could go on and on and on and so could you. We speak a language that people simply don't understand. I was a teacher for years before I was a bishop. And I I had the experience of trying to communicate something to my students that I thought was very, very important. But I could see from the look on their face, you know, the glazed look, they didn't have a clue what I was talking about. Now, the temptation of of the incompetent teacher is simply to think if you say it often enough or louder, they're finally going to get it. Well, they don't because the glazed look just becomes the shut eye. You've got to find other words and other images to communicate what you think is terribly important for them to understand. And if you can find the right words or the right images, you can see the scales fall from their eyes, the eureka moment. Ah, now I get it. And that, that's what th- those moments make teaching worthwhile. Now, very often the church seems to me to be like the incompetent teacher who says... Well, if I just say it often enough, surely it's going to, they're going to get it. If I say it louder, it's not going to happen. 
And it's not as if we haven't done this before. The church has been doing this through history over and over and over again. Again, as many of you know. But we have to do it differently in our time. Vastly changed and changing circumstances. Now, we, at this Proclaim Conference, we're kind of launching this thing called Catholic Leaders Formation Network. It's a co cooperation between ACU, in particular the La Salle Academy, and CSYMA, a Catholic Schools Youth Ministry Association that I had something to do with down in Canberra. Now, this is an excellent initiative, so uh, consider it launched. <laughs> but all I'm... <laughs> oh, yeah. All I am saying is that these kinds of initiatives are all about training people who can do some of the stuff that I'm talking about. Leaders who are capable of imagining a new paradigm, not just crying in their beer. Leaders who can imagine and even speak some kind of new language. And by language I mean, again, word and action. Now, in other words, to make of our local communities, and I mean parishes, an experience of encounter with Jesus Christ crucified and risen, not some moral exemplar who lived thousands of years ago and gave us good example. Who cares? Well, I do actually, but what I need, <laughs> what I need is Jesus Christ crucified and risen as presence and power here and now to rescue me from my drowning cave. That's what I'm talking about. Encounter with him. You know, the, the boys apparently in their cave in Thailand, when the first divers appeared uh, from the water with their lights, the boys said, who are you? They said, we're from England. <laughs> well... Again, it's like Jesus erupting into our cave. Who are you? Who do people say I am? And he doesn't say I'm from England. <laughs> now, this is what we're talking about when we talk about a new paradigm, a new language. Encounter with him that enables the new experience of, call it, rescue. A new proclamation that doesn't take the kerygma for granted. You know what I mean by the kerygma? The fundamental announcement of what God does in, did does in Jesus. Jesus died and rose again. Sometimes we take this fundamental stuff for granted. So, so a new enlivening of the kerygma and its proclamation. And I hope again this Catholic Leaders Formation Network and the National Centre for Evangelisation will help us do that and not just whistle in the dark. Now, Pope Francis is an old man. He's almost 82. That's very old. <laughs> That's even older than Cardinal Dew and me. <laughs> but young people, or a lot of young people, and not just young people, get him. They get the language he speaks and the gestures he accomplishes. And all kinds of people outside the church, they get him in a way they don't usually get the Catholic church. Now, the kind of church that he imagines and speaks about and promotes from the chair of Peter is a church that reaches deep, into the caves of young people. It's a church that's mystical, that doesn't just speak about God, but actually offers the experience of God, that overwhelming experience of God that I think is properly called mystical. Who cares if a about a church that's efficient and all that stuff? but isn't a mystical church. As one writer said in a thing I read recently, people are fed up with Christianity understood and experienced as a, a moralism 
shorn of all poetry and extreme light. Well, we need the poetry. We need the extreme life that you see in Jesus. So a mystical church, a missionary church that doesn't just sit back and circle the wagons, isn't just a kind of glorified glee club where the members look at each other and talk only to each other. Who cares about all that? We don't need another glee club. So a church which is under pressure, is tempted to close ranks, get out. And I don't know what it means. Sometimes I think I should get out of my office and out of the that big house I live in and the, perhaps even the cathedral from time to time and get out into the streets of Brisbane. I won't do it. <laughs> well, I will do it, but not as crudely as that may sound. But again, the, the whole paradigm, because I as a bishop can get caught, and these guys sitting in the front row would know what I'm talking about, you can get caught up in a kind of a paradigm that you don't particularly want, but you can't see the way out. Perhaps bishops need rescuing. <laughs> So a mission, now we will talk a lot about this through these days, I'm just sort of touching on mountaintops. A merciful church, not wagging the finger or that brilliant image that the Pope has given us of you know, picking up the teachings of the church and throwing them at people as rocks. You know, the woman caught in adultery. Take that. Not that, but, but a church that really understands the wounded human heart. The kind of deep empathy we felt for those boys in the cave. That's, that's the quality of mercy. A small church, by which I don't mean numerically, but not a big church that's into power and prestige and winning arguments and bashing other people down. Who is she that stands triumphant? And so on. But a small church, in the sense of a humble church, a simple church, a listening church, one who can walk with people and not just wish them well and say bye bye. And in the end, a joyful church. Why would young people be interested in a joyless church? God knows they should never be part of it. But in the end, that's that's the that's the acid test. Now, you know, artificial joy is worse than no joy. So we're talking about the joy that Easter alone can give birth to. Joy is an Easter thing. It's not fun, necessarily. It's not happiness. It's more, 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 more. And only Easter can get, bring it to birth. Now, all of this, and here I conclude, is about, the, it looks to the plenary council. Now, this conference, and we've seen it already, is part of the journey of the Plenary Council. The Plenary Council is not so much an event out there in 2020. No, no. The Plenary Council, folks, it's already begun. It has three phases. Preparation, celebration, implementation. Got it? PCI. Well, the preparation is well, that first phase is well and truly underway. So the, the plenary council replaces nothing. It just gracefully and simply gathers everything to itself, including the proclaimed conference. So this is part of the journey of the plenary council. When will the journey end? God alone knows, and I mean that. Now this, the crucial thing is to, to understand and believe that all of this journeying is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That the plenary council wasn't an administrative or bureaucratic decision of the bishops, it was a, an act of discernment over years and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So, so the Spirit has brought the journey of the plenary council to be. If you don't believe that, all you're going to be left with is administration or bureaucracy. And who cares? Or politics. Who cares even more? <laughs> it's not an administrative event. It's not a bureaucratic decision. It's not a political jest. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, not only in bringing it to birth in its origin, but at every step of the journey to the celebration of the Plenary Council and the implementation far beyond. 
Now, the, the Holy Spirit is messy. Certainly consoling, we call the Spirit the consoler, but also the disruptor. So we are going to be disrupted. There are going to be surprises. There are going to be dislocations. There will be moments on this journey when we think it's got off the, gone off the rails, that this is going nowhere fast. That's what happens on a journey of discernment when you are seeking to listen to what the Spirit is saying. If you're imprisoned in your own expectations, nothing is going to happen. So we, And I think Shane's image taken from the New Testament, get out of the boat, out onto the water, is spot on. So this is, this is a spirit moment in the life of the church in Australia. The spirit's been let loose by God and is doing stuff that will take us God knows where. In that sense, we're like Abraham, where God says, go, but doesn't say where. God, Abraham sets out on a journey, but he doesn't know where he's going. Only God knows. So Abraham's only hope is to keep his eye and his ear on God, ah, and go step at a time. That's all we can do at the moment. This is a seriously Abrahamic moment in the life of the church in this country. But, but it's, it's even more a moment of the spirit. You know, the great south land of the Holy Spirit, all that sort of thing. Well, let, let's start taking that seriously and, and opening ourselves to, to the disruptions and the dislocations of the spirit in order to know the consolations of the spirit. So, proclaim is part of a journey of the God who never leaves us where and as we are. And if you are not, in some sense, dislocated by these three days, then somehow the opportunity has been missed. So, let us see, as we begin the journey of these three days, let us see where it takes us by the time we come to the end. Thank you.